And our next speaker, uh, it's a pleasure to introduce, is Dr. Sally Foster. Hi, Sally. Um, currently lecturing at, at Stirling Uni, but uh, Sally was for a brief period of time a colleague of mine at the Royal Commission before moving on to Historic Scotland, where, amongst many other things, she played a pivotal role in getting the ball rolling to start the reassessment and redisplay of the St. Vigeon's collection um, before moving on and passing that on to a uh, uh, colleague, Peter Yeoman. Uh, she's the author, editor of many uh, volumes and, and publications, including the Must Read Pick Scots Gales, and uh, her most recent area of uh, research is looking into uh, casts and replicas uh, with a book just recently published on that topic, and that's what you're going to be speaking about today, looking at St John's Cross and its replicas. So over to you, Sally. Thank you very much, John. Um, can I just check that everybody's looking at the right screen, please? Yes, we are. Good to us. Lovely. Thank you very much. I'm just going to move you all out of the way so I can read my notes. <laughs> um, well, thank you very much. Welcome, um, everybody. Th I'm coming to you from Clackmannanshire. Thank you very much to the organisers for inviting me and for indeed organising everything so efficiently. I'm going to talk to admitting new voices, letting the St John's Cross and its replica speak. Um, so this afternoon, I'm going to introduce you to some key findings from my life as a replica, St John's Cross Iona. Our book, uh, which was published a year ago at the beginning of lockdown, tries to do many things, but at its heart, it's a cultural biography that explores the life of the St John's Cross and its replicas. We will see how different voices have been admitted into this story. First and foremost, replicas have been given a voice. In fact, they're not only part of the story, but the starting point. Second, the subjects themselves have been admitted a voice because of the way that their meaning has been recognised and how in the crafting of the book, they've been allowed to speak to the reader. And thirdly, because we explore contemporary social value and in doing so admit the voice of many different people who had, have had a relationship with or have a relationship with our subject. This was a joint project with my colleague, Professor Chan Jones, top right. It has its origins in the 2012 Iona Research Seminar organised by Historic Environment Scotland. And I'm very grateful to Peter Yeoman for having had the invitation to contribute to that. And we, Sean and I, we're both grateful to all our subsequent funders, as indicated on this slide. Now, our research, it started off as an exploration of the value of replicas at heritage sites, using the St John's Cross replica as our case study. It has expanded into a cultural biography of the life of the St John's Cross and its replicas, focusing on its 1970 replica. Our research reveals some new stories and ideas that span 12, 1200 plus years, but most of our new evidence dates from the early 19th century onwards. We call it a composite cultural biography because it treats replicas as things in their own right and links and combines the lives of the original and all its original reproductions through time. This can reveal how replicas contribute to the ongoing life of the originals and vice versa. Until last March, the St John's Cross replica was not designated. It stood out because it was the only eligible element at Iona Abbey that wasn't given any form of any form of um, formal recognition and protection by either listing or scheduling. It was not overlooked, it was actually explicitly disregarded and excluded. Now this reflected traditional ideas about authenticity in which replicas have not been valued. Such ideas assume authenticity is something intrinsic to an object. If it's a copy, it's not the real thing. It's also not a real thing in its own right because a replica is always viewed as secondary to the thing it's copied from. We take an alternative approach to authenticity and argue that replicas are original things in their own right. Our research has now led to the landmark designation of the St John's Cross replica. It has been listed at category A. Historic Environment Scotland's most recent on-site interpretation will refer now to the life of the replica, not just the 8th century cross. And the wider implications of our findings have also led to the co-production of New Future for Replicas, Principles and Guidance for Museums and Heritage, which has also been well received. 
So our book is inviting new ways of thinking about replicas and authenticity, but it also tells important new stories about the much loved world renowned island of Iona and its internationally significant carved stones with the St John's Cross biography at its core. The St John's Cross has always been at the heart of the Iona experience of pilgrimage to and around Scotland, indeed around Western Europe. It's arguably best known through its copies, but the story of the 19th century concrete replica was scarcely known and largely untold. We created the book's content, structure and design with multiple readers in mind. I'm just going to explain this to you. So if, for example, you're interested in primarily the cultural biography of the St John's Cross and its copies, you go to the centre of the book. Uh, the end of the book, part three, that's where we sort of take the implications from our findings about authenticity and say what that means for heritage practice. But the first part of the book is where we sort of set up why we think we want to explore the, the question of authenticity of replicas. We set the project in its context of Iona, and we also have a chapter that's devoted to thinking about the carved stones on Iona as a whole. So there are various ways in which you can read this book. You can chop in and out of it, uh, but you can also read it through its rich visuals, including specifically commissioned artwork from Christina Unwin. Now, our research shows how replicas can acquire authenticity. It unravels the part that social relations, craft practices, creativity, place and materiality play in the production and negotiation of their authenticity. Yet, underlying stories of human creativity, skill and craftsmanship are rendered invisible when replicas are treated as mere surrogates for a missing original. Challenging the traditional, the traditional precepts that seek authenticity in qualities that are intrinsic to the original historic objects, we show how replicas are important objects in their own right. They acquire value, authenticity and aura. The life of a replica generates networks of relationships between people, places and things, including the original historic object, and authenticity is founded on what these relationships embody. Authenticity is also founded on the dynamic material qualities of the objects. The cultural biographies of replicas and the felt relationships associated with them play a key role in the generation and negotiation of authenticity, while at the same time informing the authenticity and value of their historic counterparts through the composite biographies that are produced. We argue that replicas can work for us if we let them, particularly if clues are available about their makers' passion, creativity and craft. They have their own creative human stories, biographies that people can connect with. But why research St John's Cross? Why Iona? Well, for starters, we have this unusual modern replica, but it's only one of many island crosses. We therefore selected Iona because the St John's Cross replica, which you see standing in front of the west end of the abbey, uh, is interesting of itself, but we could also explore it in the context of other crosses on the island, the recreated abbey that it stands in front of, and the island as a whole. Some of the island's crosses are still in situ. This includes the replica, which stands in the 8th century cross base, while the fragmentary and fragile ones are now housed in the site museum, tucked behind the abbey to the left of this picture. The 8th century reconstructed body of the St John's Cross is now in that museum, while the replica stands in the above ground parts of the original cross base. The foundation stones lie in the grounds of Iona Nunnery, where they were removed in 1970. But we've also got multiple life-size and digital copies of the cross to add to the picture, with the first examples created in the early 20th, early 20th century for various museums. It also transpired in terms of writing the cultural biography that the creation of the replica was extremely well documented but unresearched. This project ultimately won concrete prizes, or prizes for concrete. We could therefore research extensive art archival back sources, physical remains, I showed you those in the last slide, family archives and discovered a homemade cine, cine film all about it. This was made by Murdo Mackenzie, pictured, son of one of the engineers. We could also interview some of those who were involved or witness the events. Taking a cultural biographical approach means that we're exploring the lives of our subject and as such they have voices. Objects speak to us through the effect they have on us. 
In writing the cultural biography section of the book, I adopted the device of beginning chapters by putting words in the mouth of the cross and its replica. I didn't make that up. The, the Anglo-Saxons did this in the eighth century in their dream of the rude. I did this to make you, the readers, sit up and think about specific issues that I wanted you to think about, even to introduce a degree of uh, discomfort. But I also wanted to remind the reader how we experience things, the effect these things would have had on people in the past and why and how we are affected today. So the, the book itself involved interdisciplinary research. That's a characteristic of, of producing a composite um, cultural biography. So we employed lots of diverse methodologies and sources. Ultimately, uh, these led to, the, to the, my identification of what I thought were the key moments in the biography of the cross. This sort of approach also leads to a sort of temporal perspective on meanings, values and authenticity, in this case, 1200 years. So we're looking at how the meanings, values of the cross change through time. The key resources that we could use were the material culture, documentary sources and people for both oral history and ethnographic work. The ethnography offers the contemporary dimension and its findings helped identify themes that were explored throughout the, 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 the biography. Uh, given our agency as researchers, um, we also have to uh, admit that there's another phase in the biography of the cross to introduce, which is a, a kind of resurgence and interest in it. We are agents in that, it's in, in inevitable. So this artwork from the book is another way of summarising those key moments that uh, we identified. And the rest of my talk, I'm going to focus on the central body of these, but with an emphasis on understanding the 19th century replica. But just to give you a quick overview, we start with what we call salvation, wounds and resurrection, the creation of the original cross and its falling down and re-erection. Uh, we move on to its fragmenta fragmentation. It's then rediscovered by uh, antiquarians. Um, it's a silent witness in the context of the rebuilding of the, of the abbey. Uh, the reconstructed cross falls down. That leads to the birth of the concrete replica. Understandings of the St John's Cross are transformed through the research of the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. Ultimately, the fragmented original is reunited. The place in the world of the St John's Cross has now been completely transformed by current ideas, Ewan Campbell, Adrian Maldonado, etc. And through our own research, we're arguably leading to some resurgence in it, its life as well just to give you a picture of that. So we had, um, I, want, I need to say a little bit more about the ethnography, but um, we clearly had some specific questions to explore, but I'm going to proceed to just tell you what our methodology was to give you some sense of that. So we undertook focused short-term ethnography consisting of semi-structured interviews and participant observation. Our interviews, largely long ones, took place with local residents, visitors, heritage professionals, members of the local religious groups and people involved in the replica's creation. We also held a small digital workshop where participants produced a 3D photogrammetric model of the replica. This digital practice provided an important arena for focused group interviews, one at the start of the co-production and one at the end. We also extended elements of this approach to a workshop with Iona Primary School some context is now needed. Iona has been famously described as a thin place where only tissue paper separates the material from the spiritual. But from an ethnographic and biographical perspective, we found it to be a richly textured, thick place. For a tiny island, there are multiple communities and many gazes. This means that there's considerable nuance to how the abbey and cross crosses were perceived. It's also a place that bears, as Mari MacArthur describes it, a burden of history and legend, of beliefs and of expectation. And our research has illuminated some of the temporal aspects of this. So we identified multiple contemporary communities, categories of people who have also had a long history of engagement with Iona. And perhaps the key thing to uh, point out here is that there's a sense of two main communities on Iona, the islanders and the Iona community, the religious community established by, by George MacLeod. Iona emerges as a place with special qualities. No one gets to Iona by mistake, Gordon told us. We're using pseudonyms, by the way. 
Our interviews revealed how visitors negotiate authentic relationships with the place and its inhabitants through their own individual and family biographies. It was people, non-islanders, who connected to and loved Iona in some way and who made the replica happen. Loving Iona, loving Iona is central to the replica story. As you all know, Iona is famed for its internationally significant assemblage of carved stones. And um, there's a very long history of antiquarian interest, the detail of which I can't go into here. Iona has also been a place of interest to travellers, long been a place of interest to travellers. I was fortunate to discover a previously unpublished illustrated account of a day trip to Staffa and Iona in 1825. And we've published that um, uh, parts of that in the book. And I just include a snapshot of it here because I particularly like this image of the little boys who climb to the top of the St Martin's cross so that they can be sketched by the antiquarian in question. There's also a very long history of caring for the condition of the ruined abbey and for the island's carved stones. For over a century now, the Iona Cathedral trustees, British set of bodies, bodies of Historic Environment Scotland and the Iona community, the religious community, have sought solutions to the protection and display of Iona's carved stones. It is notable how in the 20th century, as debates rage, raged about how to care for Iona's carved stones, they are both agents and expressions of difference between local and multiple non-local parties. The stones symbolise in a metaphorical way the concerns of individuals and communities, communities who perceive the island and its constituent places in very different ways. There are certain parts of the island that particularly symbolise struggles for identity and autonomy among different communities and where their relationships continue to be negotiated and constructed and where the carved stones play a role in that. Inevitably, the Abbey was the pinch point. And a stark example of this would be the attitude of George MacLeod, founder of the Iona community, to the Abbey's carved stones. MacLeod was encouraged to restore the Abbey by Sir David Russell, a wealthy Fife businessman who came to Iona for his holidays and eventually built a family home there. Autocratic, patrician, charismatic and quick-witted, MacLeod had a passionate mission for a socially relevant church, but his personality and radical agenda created divisions on the island as he sought to create a formal religious community, one that controversially incorporated the island's name. A civil servant working with him to try to secure the preservation of the archaeological interests of the, of the sites described him as purposeful. His programme of restoration often pitted the Iona community and indeed Iona Cathedral trustees against the Ministry of Public Works. Looking for ways to preserve Iona's carved stones exposed very different attitudes. MacLeod's interest was a living church and to be a living place meant that stone sculpture designed to be outside best belonged where it was and should not be removed to a museum for conservation purposes. For MacLeod, and I quote, the old shafts and crosses are not totem poles of an ancient faith. They still live. And he's memorably reported as saying that the stones might well be allowed to decay in, God's, in the open in God's own time. With the St John's Cross having fallen in 1957, this was the context for the creation of the replica. Let's now dip into the composite cultural biography. The cross was born in the 8th century, in a highly creative period at one of um, the leading Irish monasteries. The interdisciplinary scholarship of multiple scholars now argues for the development at the heart of this early medieval monastery of a complex of novel architectural features that explicitly model themselves on the Church of the Holy Sepulchre in Jerusalem, creating a place of heavenly salvation on earth. And you can read more about this in um, Ewan Campbell and Adrian Maldonado's article. The embodied experience of monks and pilgrims was to be linked to the concept of the perception of salvation that they could achieve. Entering the monastery, inhabitants and visitors would be directed to the burial place of St Columba. Standing in front of it, the St John's Cross was at the heart of the action and critical to that experience. The most likely context for the creation of the cross and the stone shrine was the mid 8th century translation and enshrinement of some of Columba's relics. Iona created the world's first high cross, St John's Cross, first Irish stone shrine chapel, first paved monastic road, and these were all activities that befitted St Columba and his memory. 
In the new Jerusalem model, certain mirrors feature key features in Jerusalem, and arguably the St. John's cross represented Christ's cross. It seems it was deliberately cited so that the evening shadow shines on the entrance wall of the shrine chapel that contained St. Columba's burial place. The cross enchanted and it spoke to receptive audience who experienced it and its context. As I think you probably all know, the St. John's Cross is argued on the basis of work by Ian Fisher and Ian Scott of the Royal Commission on the Ancient Historical Monuments of Scotland to be the world's first ringed high cross. And the idea is that the shortly after its creation, the cross, which didn't originally have a, a ring, fell over and uh, in putting it back together, they experimented and they incorporated the ring. And the cross head Today, it survives in fragments, indeed it survives in many more fractions, um, but some of these fractures are ones that relate to that, that first fall. Now, the subsequent history of fragmentation, the cross, original cross survives in many, play, in many pieces, is difficult to evidence. In 1699, the lower shaft was first observed um, in situ, to survive in situ. Uh, and antiquarians over the years, they found and they collected together other fragments, but it was not until 1927 that its dispersed surviving fragments were reunited. The antiquarian rebirth of the cross occurred as people began to piece together the fragments and realised just how significant a monument this must have been. And I must thank Mari MacArthur and Ian Fisher for bringing this previously unpublished 1850 source to my attention. It reveals the first time that someone, uh, an antiquarian called Henry Davenport Graham, who lived on the island for a long time, realised that there was a massive crosshead to be reconstructed amongst all those fragments. And these fragments, um, as we look at them then, as we look at them now, they offer important clues about how things break up and, the, uh, and they can tell important parts of the stories and individual fragments when could go on and have later lives. And the eagle eyed amongst you may have noticed um, clue, various clues to that in this image. Um, you can ask me about that later if you want to. <laughs> Such antiquarian interest led to the recognition of the art historical significance of the St John's Cross and someone realised the in situ shaft belonged to the crosshead fragments. Approaching the west end doorway of the abbey in 1927 you could hardly miss its reconstruction. This was the personal initiative of an Irish Celtic scholar and Iona visit, visitor, Professor R.A.S. McAllister, assisted on the ground by local arts and craft artist, Alexander Ritchie of Iona Celtic art fame. A love of Iona underpins what they did. The first plaster casts of part of the cross had been made by Ritchie in 1901. And after the reconstruction, he made his first uh, jewelry copies as well, like this, if you can, uh, you can see that. Ritchie was exceptionally proud of his, this, this reconstruction. From 1938, the Iona community rebuilt the abbey around the reconstructed cross, seen here in about 1955. If you remember MacLeod and his views, the reconstructed cross was effectively standing as a silent witness to the abbey's rebirth and to the, the birth of that living church around it. It was as the fallen cross that the monument came once more to the fore. The 1927 reconstruction fell in 1951, was reconstructed in another and rather crude way in 1954, and fell again in 1957. The lack of action to do anything about it led regular visitor A.C. Phillips to privately publish a book about its history. He expressed his concerns about its condition for all those who, I quote, for all those who love Iona and wrote regularly to the press about this issue. Actually, Philip's wealthy wife, Dorothy Una Ratcliffe, was first impressed about the cross, expressing her emotions and concerns in poetry. However, it was the fallen cross that ignited the interest of the Ancient Monuments Board to seek a solution, not just to the cross, but to all of Iona's sculpture. This was to take a very long time, certainly the cross episode of it, and in the meantime, the 1970 concrete rock replica got created. To cut a very, very long story short, with parties unable to find a solution to the fate of the tumbled cross, it took a number of Iona lovers with vision and money to make the case for and arrange the creation of a concrete replica. 
The driving force was Major David F. O. Russell, who was the son of Sir David, who'd encouraged George MacLeod to um, rebuild the Abbey. His dogged determination and skills in diplomacy eventually brought the project to fru fruition over an 11 year period through his agency with the Iona Cathedral trustees. The replica was cast in concrete from a very carefully designed model made of plaster by the noted Edinburgh-based Brown's founder, George Mancini. This was constructed from molding the original and repeating those molded impressions to fill in missing sections of what is essentially largely a symmetrical design. Only in a few places was any conjecture needed. And the people who did this, they were driven by a very firm desire for honesty to the original in form, detail, and in their use of concrete to its color and texture. Casting the cross required the skills and ingenuity of an artist, John Laurie from Edinburgh College of Art, somebody who was very used to working in concrete. He could conceive how to create and implement such a very large casting, which used gelatin on a quite massive scale. The cross was then uh, brought to Iona on top of the Islanders annual supply of coal. Here engineers from a company called Exposag Limited both Iona lovers and delighted to have got the contract to do this, erected the highly engineered replica with painstaking care. For the cross has got guts, being very successfully engineered in post-tensioned pre-stressed pre concrete by John Scott to withstand winds of 120 miles per hour. The unique construction of a cross in this particular way tested the limits of craftsmanship in concrete, involved considerable ingenuity and creativity, and required significant levels of personal and institutional investment spanning a wide network of important and influential people across Scotland. It effectively caps the 20th century recreation and reinvention of Iona Abbey and the role of the influential Russell family in that enterprise, while giving a voice to, to the important role of the Iona Cathedral trustees. Today, the latter, the trustees, um, have a somewhat overlooked presence on the island. On that turn to fix findings, we explored the part that replicas play in social networks. I'm up to my neck in replicas, it's how I make my living here, Islander Isla explained to us, and replicas are indeed core to Iona's identity and being. For over a century, visitors have gone home with Alexander and Euphemia Rich's Iona Celtic art. If visitors go to Isla shop and they buy a modern casting from the original early 20th century Ritchie moulds, they go away feeling that they've purchased a bit of Iona because of the stories embodied in this act. As Isla puts it, the objects acquire a significance that is related to their cultural provenance, but also to the personal experience that the objects had when they were on Iona. They're loaded objects. The loaded nature of the replica rubs itself in various ways. Despite the fact that if you go to the Abbey, it was, until our research, explicitly treated as a proxy for the secure original and as a didactic tool. One example is the way it contributes to the life of the original, most obviously how it generates a shadow that casts itself on the shrine. Without the replica, and indeed without the rebuilt shrine, the historical significance of this relationship would not have been recognised and its emotional impact would be missed. And I've been able to trace the, the relationship between the fallen cross, rebuilt cross, rebuilt shrine, etc., most usefully in postcards, uh, as you can see here in this slide. Another example is the way the crosses are regarded as silent witnesses. A studied or cultivated indifference was marked in some older members of the island community and appears to be bound up with their historical, originally unhappy attitude to the abbey and its modern day religious tenants. But this belies more subtle attitudes to the Abbey and their sense of ownership of the crosses, for as Peter put it, it would cause absolute civil war if the crosses were going to be taken off the island. While it might appear that the crosses are taken for granted, their wallpaper in terms of your day to day life, said Isla, this is not the case. It was also uh, important to observe that the replica was consistently attributed spiritual value and was no less significant in this regard than the original. Every cross is a replica, isn't it? said Dora. 
Our interviewees had little opportunity to negotiate authenticity by engaging with the historical network of people and places implicated in the replica's cultural biography. Indeed, no one, the heritage professionals included, really knew anything about the replica's history. The original story is better known, the artistic and technical achievements and how it kept falling down. The relationship that our interviewees had with the replica only began to change when we showed them some photographs of its makers at work. The craft and skills that went into making the replica, into devising and creating its form, and the technically challenging mould from which the con concrete was cast started to become manifest and be valued, as this quote shows with its, its, its talk of the human story. The replica was largely undertaken by Iona lovers, and with the visuals, the passion starts to emerge from out of the concrete. The pictures generated thoughts and emotions, hooks, that released the potential significance of the replica, segueing into notions about past and present craft and spirituality, and the evolving character of island living. A sense emerged already generally that the replica, already generally acknowledged to be beautiful in some way, was handmade by skilled and connected craftsmen who took a big pride in their work, and that if it mattered to them, it should matter to the wider community. It was recognised to be a significant exercise, not cheap and an investment worth protecting. The photographs that we showed also became a source of glorious revelation in a spiritual sense, as described by Gertrude here. Interviewees talked of the dedication and skills of honest craftsmen whose work was an act of worship in some way, like the early medieval monks. Our ethnographic study focused on intangible social and spiritual values surrounding a replica and showed these to be rich and highly nuanced. But we also revealed the importance of materiality, in particular the material clues to what Cornelius Holtorf calls pastness, being visibly of the past. Visible ageing, an aspect of that concept of pastness, remains a highly a quality highly sought out by people and the use of modern material, concrete, proved a culturally constructed barrier to appreciation of authenticity for some, while a revelation to others, as we saw with Gertrude. Patina, weathering and lichen were particularly mentioned and valued. Cultural att attitudes to technology affect the reception of materials, not least concrete. Architectural historian Adrian Forty describes the slipperiness of concretes, multiple seemingly contradictory characteristics. And we certainly found this. Working in conservation, Reuben had it drilled to him, quote, over decades of my work life, that there's something not quite right and kosher about concrete. Specific qualities and place and setting are also critical to the way in which the authenticity of the replica can be experienced and tend to be overlooked in the face of an overriding emphasis on parsonless and social relationships. Just to select one aspect of this, let's return to the shadow. For some of our interviewees, with being outside, there's a palpable pleasure that comes from what feels like an individual experience of the St John's Cross replica. An unmediated encounter that means, as Dora put it, emotion springs up unbidden. This is the special privilege of islanders who walk around the island, sorry, walk around the abbey out of, sea, out of season, or those who can come to the abbey after the HES staff have gone away, leaving the abbey gates open, and the last ferry, ferry is also away for the day. Tracy, an American holid, holidaying on Iona, sums this up in her description of the replica as beloved of the shadow. It moves the people who come here. As already mentioned, the eventide shadow of the replica cast on St. Clumber's shrine is now thought to be a deliberate design feature of the 8th century craftsman, a feat unintentionally recreated when the replica was erected in 1970 against the backdrop of what was by then the reconstructed shrine. The fabric that conjures the shadow is 20th century, but the experience still feels special and provides a link to the past, responding to the Columban legacy in an intimate way, as Isla described it. New or alternative uh, senses of authenticity emerge when we introduce people by visuals to some of the humans behind, the people behind the creation of the replica, some of the human story behind the creation of the replica. They question their own assumptions about the absence of creativity, skills and craftsmanship. In different ways, the, rap the replica started to acquire an authenticity as people gained the ability to connect 
aspects of the replica's biography to their own lives, not least their special relationship to Iona and their personal spiritual beliefs. As Molly put it, information is formational, and we have seen how visual material helps people to negotiate authenticity and develop new values. Murdo Mackenzie's homemade film, I mentioned previously he is the son of one of the Exposag engineers, shows the delivery and erection of the replica in its 1970s island context, and you can look at this on YouTube. We see it arrive by boat with the annual delivery of coal, the concrete mixer breaks down and is towed away in disgrace, and the rush to finish the replica before a wedding, which we also enjoy. I'm grossly compressing that story, but the point is that the people involved emerge as personalities, and we share their toils and tribulations. With the oral testimonies we collected of those involved and witnesses, we can develop a, rich, a full, rich and nuanced cultural biography of this replica from 1200 years ago through to present times. The workshop we conducted with the island school children illustrates the importance and potential of such biographical details for effective experience and education. We introduced the children to the composite biography of the St John's Cross using visual archival materials, including historic postcards and excerpts from Murdo Mackenzie's film. Most of them, to judge from their artwork that they produced for us, were captivated by the St John's Cross, or should I say Cross's story, particularly where they could situate it in a network of people and places familiar and meaningful to them. And the visuals were what provided the necessary triggers. Our ethnographic insights therefore illustrate the ways in which a replica can acquire authenticity and aura, how its life impacts positively on the life of the original and other copies, and how a replica can generate and extend network, networks and in that way mediate experiences of authenticity. There is a case for considering this replica as both a celebration in concrete, that's of the St John's Cross, of itself and of the people who made it, and a celebration of concrete. In most senses, replicas are therefore no different from other aspects of our material heritage in terms of how they can work. Visible age value is an important consideration, but they still require a conscious effort to give them voice. Once freed from their secondary existence, today's re replicas become originals in their own right, part of the archaeology of the future. Replicas can be as old and as authentic as feel them to be. There is no magic age at which something becomes old enough to be perceived as authentic or of value. Things come to life when someone invests interest in them. A Japanese born visitor showing Iona to a visiting shaman friend captured this sentiment. When people feel it, they will start loving it. I would come back and admire this replica. It will gain respect from people and will acquire its own history and therefore not be a replica anymore. In the Far East, exact copies, copies are treated as originals, with replication valued as part of the endless cycle of life. In today's world, given current ideas about authenticity and value now permeating the West, we should therefore not have to travel so far before replicas at heritage sites can be appreciated in the round. Created out of the love of many people for Iona, not least Major David Russell, the 1970 concrete replica of St John's Cross on Iona illustrates that potential. So to conclude, um, what I've done is I've sought to give you some insight into the composite cultural biography of the St John's Cross and its replicas, particularly the 19th century uh, concrete replica, and to illustrate how this illuminates the contemporary authenticity and value of it as a replica and indeed replicas more widely. We've let the St John's Cross and its replica speak by admitting new voices. We've, ad we've admitted replicas into the story. Um, we've admitted new voices in the way that things are recognised to speak to us. Uh, we've admitted new voices in the way in which we've crafted and presented the book. I've tried to do that. I'd love to hear what you think about that. Uh, but also in how we have listened to the voices of people through our ethnographic work. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Sally. That was fantastic and perfect timing also.
Uh, OK, we have a few questions here. Get some more questions rolling in, people. Um, starting off, and I think you covered this, but uh, maybe you could reiterate it. Um, Michael Brennan is asking, uh, is the cross made of reinforced concrete? You made reference to pre-stressing or post-stressing. I can't remember. Yeah, no, it's, it's got very intricate insides <clears throat> and um, it had to be designed to withstand 120 miles per hour. So it's kind of applying, I'm not a concrete specialist or an engineer, it's applying the sort of technology you might use in a bridge to create uniquely this uh, upstanding uh, cross. Uh, it's very robust. And I think it helps us to understand why the original might have fallen down so much um, that they had to create it to withstand winds of 120 miles per hour. Well, yes, I mean, certainly, uh, and, and it has withstood that. It, it still looks um, remarkably solid, doesn't it, um, mm. this time? Um, I thought it was very interesting also that you, you mentioned that relevance and the quote from the Japanese born visitor. Um, I, I have a friend who's um, involved with uh, building heritage, and, and that's something that he often quotes as this um, Far Eastern um, thing where temples there are regularly rebuilt, but nobody sees it as modern. It's just the thing is replaced, replaced and replaced, and um, it still has the same uh, artistic and social uh, significance and value to them. Anna Ritchie is asking, um, if the original fragments of St John's Cross were in Edinburgh, do you think that the replica in Iona would have the same impact? That's interesting, isn't it? Yeah. Um, well, they were brought back from Edinburgh. The remains did go to Edinburgh and they were there for, uh, for quite a long period while they were conserved. And there was a lot of celebration on Iona when they were uh, ultimately returned. Um, people have been, we, we, did, we, we did look at the difference between how people perceive the original in the museum and the, uh, the replica. And because one is in a museum and it's in there's something about moving things into a mu into an enclosed space and into a museum that often makes people perceive them in very different ways. So they become more art objects rather than monuments that function in the way that I was just describing. The the the, uh, the there's something about being outside and being in the original sit location, etc., that gives the the replica re really adds to the experience and, and sense of authenticity of it. I think it's very important that people can make the connection. I think sadly a lot of people do not actually even go round the back of the abbey and go and take a proper look at the original. Mm. Um, so I think there's there's a lot more that, that can be done to uh, enrich the experience of visitors to Iona by being able to think about the relationship between these two things. So the replica has got its own story to tell and it's only now just starting to be told. Um, the original has got it, own, but the two are so inextricably linked that having the two together and the, the potential for what can be done there is, is, is gigantic. I suspect were the original still in Edinburgh, sorry, was, was it in Edinburgh? Um, yes, the value that would be attached to the um, replica would be different in terms of social value. And interestingly, what we were doing, this wasn't like the case of Hilton of Cadbull where Sean Jones did some ethnographic work where the, mm. the context was highly contested there is at present no, you know, kind of contest attached to any aspect of the St. John, John's no. Cross. Um, so that, that's a very different scenario. So I've, I've touched on a rather few different things there, so I hope that well, begins that, to that, That's a good answer. Um, here we have another question. Now, Bruce is asking, did the concrete craftsmen have access to the sketches shown early in your presentation? And if so, why not include the detail as with the, the, the stone Balfour Cross? I, at Northall Mark Hinch. Include the detail of what? Do we know detail? The stone of... Balfour Cross at Northall Mark Hinch. I'm not sure. Um, okay, well, I cannot. I can only part answer that question probably. So the the um, 1850 antiquarian image that I showed that has only recently. It turned up a. It was. Uh, I can't remember. It, it, it's a. It's a fairly recent. It's a family archive that's only recently gone into a public archive. And in fact, at the time when I was trying to find it, it wasn't actually accession. So. Thank you to Ian Fraser, who enabled me to find this in the Royal Commission on the Ancient Historical Monuments. So, no, that not all sources were known. And that was what was really lovely about that source, because it shows there's a whole episode in people discovering the cross and its significance that was previously uh, not, not properly understood or, or, or charted. Um, no, and I think one of the things that's really quite interesting about the difference between the original and the replica 
if you go and look at the replica, they do not pretend it's anything but a replica. You can see the concrete seams down the side and it was deliberately designed in that way by the artist. So there was no, no pretense, it wasn't anything other than a replica. But what they did was they tried to show it as it would originally have looked when it was recreated with the ring. If you go and you look at the original, of course, it's, it's shattered into lots and lots of fragments. I mean, it, you know, it fell down in the eighth century, it fell down in who knows what happened in between. It then fell down in 1951 and it smashed again in 1954. So actually the original is really fragmented. And if you look at the pieces, if you go look at it, the pieces, it's, you know, it's stuck together. You can see the joins on the original, which you don't see. The, the sort of biography, what I'm trying to say is the biography of the original is not evident in the replica. You do no. not see that story. In the same way, dare I say, if you go to the Royal Commission on the Ancient Historical Monuments of Scotland, wonderful inventory, actually the fragmentation, that bio biography side of it's not there because the focus was on creating it as the eighth century monument, mm -hmm. not telling. So going back to that 1850 image where I said, oh, you know, can you spot something? It, I, I only spotted this late in the day and actually it is illustrated in the inventory, but it's not kind of highlighted that some of the fragments, big fragments, they've got slots and, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Sockets. Yeah, sockets in them. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, you know, what, what was that story about? Um, mm. So the, the, the fragments in theory, and it's actually difficult to see that now because they're all put back together. Um, there's a story in those pieces that is really important actually when we're researching things now that we really look hard at the, the fragments and we look at all the breaks and we look for secondary use of all these fragments and try and add that into the picture. Mm. So I think that's something that um, hadn't previously been done in the case of the St John's Cross. And I realized I, in retrospect, is an area I could possibly have spent more on time on in the book, um, but actually some things you couldn't do anyway, because you couldn't access the original and you had to kind of go back to photographs and well, you know, photographs tell you so much, but not the full picture. Uh, Anna East, East Nor Easter Roth is asking, do you think the shadow event is integral to the sense of spiritual value? Um, I think it, Yes. <laughs> yeah. Don't ask me for the finer details, but yeah, no, I mean, I think it, I, I, um, oh, I'm the full up my name. Um, yes, so the, the, the full significance of that shadow has only recently been uh, sort of recognised in, in, in art historical circles. And regardless of that recent art historical discovery, the fact that people who go there now, for them, it is part of their, ex their experience of Iona and it is being perceived in a uh, spiritual as in religious but also uh, I'm not religious but I still go there and I'm moved by the you know you, you know you're very privileged when you've you, you sort of witnessed that it's a really important part of part of the experience of the of, of the cross is to watch that yeah and yeah. the way it sort of shines you know directly onto the door at certain times shines directly onto the door of the of the shrine is very special lots yeah. of people brought that up with us yes uh, Devin S is asking, have you looked into other replicas, such as the Hilton the Cadwell Pictish Stone? Um, that's the, the, the Barry Grove one, but you have been collating, um, have you not, uh, casts and replicas? Yes, there's sort of several aspects to maybe ways of asking that. So personally, I've been doing some research, sort of trying to take an overview, if you like, of sort of the history of the production of replicas of early medieval sculpture, as it happens early medieval sculpture in, in the main um, across Britain and Ireland. Um, work, other, there are other people kind of working in that field as well. There's a bit of a kind of replica term with people getting interested in this. And it's, and it's interesting because the context in which replicas of insular material are being produced are quite different from the sorts of contexts in which copies of you know, classical Roman and Greek and mm. Renaissance stuff are being produced. There's some really interesting stories there. But the other thing to say about Hilton of Cadwell is that my colleague, Sean Jones, did an ethnographic study which was which is look, looking at well it looked at the process of the excavation of the um, the lower portion when it was discovered in the site and uh, it includes the the context of the, the the finishing of the replica so that's published in a in a book published by the Society of Antiquaries of Scotland called a fragmented masterpiece so there's a very detailed ethnographic study by my colleague Sean Jones on the replica and my own research is sort of ongoing more broadly in relation to to replicas. Yeah. Right. Actually, there's a bit of an in chap just to plug the book, chapter one of the book gives you a little bit of context for that. Okay, um, quick message uh, from Ian Fisher, just saying that Graham uh, was in his personal archive 
I think that's why it was um, hidden away there and not uh, you needed his help to, to find that. Oh, yeah. No, I, just to say thank you very much. Ian pointed it out to me. Myron MacArthur mentioned it to me because I think Mari was involved with the family in the donation of this archive to the Royal Commission on the Ancient Historical Monuments of Scotland. And then Ian Fraser helped me to locate it because it hadn't been accessioned at the time I was trying to track it down. Yeah. So thank you, everybody, not least Ian Fisher. Thank you. OK, right. If you can keep the answer brief, uh, we'll have all uh, squeeze in one last question. Um, C.I. Gamble is saying thank you so much for a fantastic talk. I wonder if Dr. Porter had any feelings about the medieval perception of mysticism magic and the impact the cross would have had in terms of supernatural beliefs. Uh, Can you I'm answer that? The path later. I think that's a bit I too think come, come to, <laughs> uh, So there you go, CI Gamble, come back to the chat room later and yeah. um, and also, uh, we need to team up with some of the art historians amongst us here as well, who's a domain that is better than mine, probably they're pretty good, good idea. Okay, well, thank you so much for a fascinating talk.